Yep. Okay. Well, it's seven oh one now, so I think we'll get started. People can are still able to stream um, come in. Um, so if they're late and miss a few minutes, that's okay. Um, but anyways, my name is Monique Arts, and with me today is Sarantia. I'm uh, this. A conservation biologist with Blazing Star Environmental. I'm sorry, Sarantia, I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay, yeah, and yeah, as Mel said, my name is Sarantia Katsaris, and I am a species at risk biologist with Blazing Star Environmental. Um, and we will be part of the main team doing the field surveys this summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so really excited tonight to be talking about the species at risk monitoring that we're going to be doing on farms across. Ontario this spring and summer in partnership with Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association. Um, so as a biologist who grew up on a farm, I'm very passionate about uh, this type of monitoring work that we get to do. Um, I really recognize the importance of stewardship programs on agricultural lands to protect species at risk. So really excited to be talking about this and even more excited to go out and do the monitoring this year. So thank you to everyone who's joined us, uh, whether you're a producer that will be visiting or maybe you're just interested in protecting species at risk, uh, welcome everyone. Okay, so before we dive into things, I just want to uh, make an acknowledgement that this webinar is provided through the Species at Risk Partnerships on Agricultural Land Program. And we're gonna be talking a bit about this program later. Um, anyways, this program is delivered by the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, and the program is funded by Environment and Cl Climate Change Canada. So before we get started, I'm just going to introduce um, Blazing Star Environmental, the, the company that Serentia and I work for. Um, so we're a smaller ecological consulting company founded in January 2015. So still pretty young, but we work on a variety of conservation projects for a variety of clients, uh, from government to not-for-profits, uh, to land trusts and even private landowners like some of yourselves. Um, so we specialize in land conservation, species and ecosystem management, um, but our favorite projects really are scientific research and monitoring projects, um, such as the one we're gonna be talking about tonight. Um, so I've had the privilege of working with Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association um, for over five years now, providing biological expertise um, to support programs, cost share programs such as StarFit and StarWatch. Um, so I've been able to have a lot of experience visiting producers and impacting assessments of, sorry, assessing the impacts of stewardship projects. Um, so I'm really happy we get to continue working um, in this, in this, on these kinds of projects with Ontario Soil and Crop. So that's a little bit about our company. Um, now I've, I kind of want to see who, who is tuned in tonight. So we have a few polls throughout this presentation and I'll just launch this poll now so you can actually participate. So first poll, I just want to know who's here. So are you one of the producers whose farm we're going to be visiting for this monitoring? Uh, if not, are you have you participated in Ontario you know, soil and crops cost share programs in the past? And if not, um, I assume you're interested in conserving species at risk, so guessing you'll select C. Uh, I'll just give a few more seconds for people's votes to come in. Almost everyone's done. Okay, it looks like most people have voted and it looks like 33% of the people here are actually participants in the monitoring program that we're doing this summer. So that's really exciting and we're really happy you've tuned in because this is going to be very relevant for you. <laughs> um, and 45% have participated in a cost share program. That's amazing. And then the other half have, hasn't yet, but they're interested. So um, we're really happy to have all of you here. Okay, so um, at a high level, our species at mo risk monitoring program, um, 
the purpose at a high level is to survey, to assess the benefits of best management practices to species at risk on farms that participated in SARPAL across Ontario. Now, I know this is a pretty heavy first slide and there's a lot of acronyms here. So I'm gonna go through and define some of these, some of the underlined uh, phrases that you see here before we dig even deeper so that everyone understands the background information of what's a best management practice and a species at risk and what's our pal? Um, and I should say that this, before I'm going into that, I should say that this monitoring program will involve um, conducting species at risk surveys across 27 participating firms um, from May, June, and into July this year. Now, since this project involves travel, uh, we need to address COVID-19. Blazing Star Environmental is very serious about COVID-19 and understands that we're in a currently in a provincial lockdown. So um, we'll be closely monitoring public health guidelines and um, adapt our survey plan as necessary. So we make sure we're in line with the guidelines and everyone is safe. Um, we do have, we currently do have a COVID protocol and it will be shared with all the producers before we go to any sites and ensure that everyone is comfortable and everyone will be safe. Um, so the current lockdown ends right before we're planning to survey. So we really, it's hard to say right now what it's gonna look like, but I'm hoping that we can still do some site visits and hoping we're still able to interact a little bit in some way with the producers. Okay. So first I'm gonna talk a little bit about what a species at risk is for those of you who don't know. A species at risk is a naturally occurring plant or animal that's in danger of disappearing from the landscape because of specific threats. Um, so each species that's designated as a species at risk is assigned a status that reflects the level of risk it faces. So the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry defines four categories of species at risk that you'll see on the screen here. And the governments of Ontario and Canada regulate impacts to species at risk and their habitat through the Endangered Species Act and the Species at Risk Act. Um, so the level of lowest concern is called special concern. And an example of a species at risk that's listed as special concern is the monarch. Um, the next level of increasing concern is threatened threatened species, um, an example of a threatened species is the bobolink. And the next level of increasing concern is endangered. So endangered populations are um, face significant threat of being extirpated. And an example is the loggerhead strike. Um, now extirpated species, um, a species is listed as extirpated when it's no longer found in Ontario, but it's found elsewhere. Um, maybe in the States or somewhere else, but not in Ontario. Okay, and some people might be asking, why do we care about species at risk anyway? Why do we spend all this money monitoring species at risk? Um, but it's really important to monitor species at risk and to protect them and their habitat because every species plays an important role in the ecosystem and healthy ecosystems depend on species diversity. So as species diversity decreases, ecosystems become less healthy. Uh, in addition, species provide benefits to farms, including rodents, uh, sorry, rodent control, crop pollination, clean water. Um, so the more species there are, the more services you're gaining from uh, species. So we need to make sure that we're uh, working to protect the species, especially populations that are declining. <clears throat> and so there are many species at risk in Ontario. Um, however, for our monitoring program, we're going to focus on these 12 species that are that rely on farmland, uh, in particular grasslands. And Serenity is going to talk more about these species in particular and how we're going to monitor for them later in the presentation. Um, but we have six birds. So the first six species there are birds two mammals, one reptile, and three insects. 
Okay, so now that we know what a species at risk is, I'm going to talk a bit about what a BMP is, or a best management practice. So the definition on the screen says it's a practical and economic approach to conserving a farm's natural resources, such as water, soil, habitat, without decreasing the farm's productivity and profitability. Um, so in other words, it's kind of a, a way of managing the land that benefits the farm um, through the protection of natural resources. Um, so there are many, many different BMPs that can be implemented, um, but here is the list of seven that we will be targeting for our monitoring program. Um, so all but BMPs are beneficial to farm, farm production and species at risk. Um, one example is Number five, cross fencing for rotational grazing. Uh, so rotational grazing is a much more efficient and economical way to graze a field, uh, while also providing more suitable habitat for grassland nesting birds than conventional grazing. So this is because rotational grazing allows sections of the field to be undisturbed until the young birds, uh, we could be talking about bobolink or eastern meadowlark, until those birds uh, leave the nest, so it provides a safe spot for um, nesting for those birds. So other examples of um, best management practices that we'll be targeting include um, tree planting, wetland and grassland restoration, uh, fencing to exclude livestock from sensitive features such as wetlands or woodlands, uh, as well as delayed haying. So um, specifically, we're going to be we're going to be surveying the BMP, so the areas of habitat that have been enhanced or created uh, for species at risk. Okay, so we have another poll now. Um, let me just launch it. Okay, so have you ever implemented a BMP on your property? Uh, if not, are you interested in impl implementing a BMP someday, uh, or maybe you don't think you ever will, but you're, you're interested in how they benefit species at risk. Oh, and I launched it now, so. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it looks like most people have voted now. So um, we have a, around 70% have actually implemented a BMP, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Around 30% who's who are interested in doing it. Um, and then 14% who likely won't, but interested in how it conserves species at risk. Great. Okay, so this table is a kind of a really nice summary of what we're monitoring this upcoming field season. So along the top are the various best management practices we'll be looking at. And along the left-hand side, you'll see all the target species at risk we're gonna be looking for. Um, now, so wherever you see X's, so yeah, the table basically shows which species at risk are anticipated to benefit from um, each of the BMPs. Um, so as you can see here, the grassland restoration best management practice is likely to impact, likely to benefit all the species at risk we're, we're monitoring um, because they're all grassland species. So enhancing grassland is gonna help all the species. Whereas um, other BMPs generally are anticipated to have impact on a smaller um, subset of the target species. So for instance, delayed haying is likely to benefit all the grassland bird species that use the grassland um, directly. Okay. okay, so then that last acronym I want to explain is SARPAL. So SARPAL is a cost 
share program run provided by Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association. Um, and it, it provides funding to producers who are interested in implementing BMPs on their property. Um, the BMPs that are funded through this program are designed to create, enhance, and protect habitat for 12 species at risk, the 12 species at risk we're looking at. Um, so this summer, we'll be visiting Sarpal producers, and we're uh, aiming to get to 27 properties. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah and Tia now. All right, thanks Mo for covering all of that. So now we're gonna get into the purpose of the SARPAL monitoring that we're doing this summer, the speech at risk monitoring. So there's a variety of uh, reasons for completing this monitoring program. First off, we have that we wanna measure the effectiveness of each of the BMPs in benefiting species at risk, specifically those 12 target species at risk and their habitat. So we wanna assess if these BMPs are providing suitable habitat and record if species at risk um, are using this created or enhanced habitat. We also would like to inspire participating producers to continue to, stu to steward their agricultural lands for species at risk conservation through a site visit with biologists. So um, of course that's gonna be up to what's happening with COVID at the time but we really are hoping that we'll be able to have an, op in, uh, an opportunity to meet the producers and, and talk with them. Next, we have provide recommendations for modifying SARPAL to maximize the benefit to species at risk. So this is a big one. So there's only a limited amount of funds for these projects and hopefully our recommendations will help stretch the funds even further and have more of an impact. Uh, we also want to provide concrete evidence to the funders of the program to prove that it is working and that it should continue into the future. Okay, so here you see a map, um, and this is a map of where we will be surveying this summer. It actually has only 23 of our 27 farms on it. Um, we haven't incorporated the delayed hang producers yet because they uh, got in um, after the other producers. Um, so you can see that there's a pretty wide spread here, which is really exciting. Um, in order to select our sites to survey, we had to consider a variety of factors. Um, so first we considered the number of BMPs implemented on the farm, because the more BMPs on the farm, uh, the more survey opportunities there are for us um, to gather data. Um, also occurrence, of target species at risk. Um, so we gathered um, information about which species at risk were where, um, of course, just from their general range and from species observations and databases, but we also gathered that from producers' um, observations themselves. They, they submit an annual survey that tells um, soil and crop what they find every year. So that was really helpful. Uh, also, we wanted to go to sites that had BMPs that were implemented a long time ago and BMPs that were implemented more recently um, so that we can track how BMPs change over time. So overall, we selected sites with a variety of BMPs and um, all of the targets are so that we can cover everything. Um, we also completed desktop reviews at e for each of the 27 producers, which involved looking at species observations in the area to determine which species at risk to target during our site visit. So on our site visit, we won't be surveying for all 12 species at risk um, because you're likely not in the range of all of them. Um, and even if you are, you probably have better habitat for certain species, so that's what we will be targeting. Okay, so now we have target species at risk. So we're gonna go over the 12 species at risk um, that, will be, that we will be looking at this summer. Um, we will also be looking at their habitat requirements and their range across Ontario. So when the maps pop up, make sure to check out uh, where you're located and then you can see if that species occurs in your range. Okay, so the first one is the barn swallow. So they are listed um, as threatened in Ontario. However, they're very widespread as you can see on the map. And they feed over open habitats, over fields and water. 
and they are blue on top, so that's quite distinct. And they also have a long forked tail and long pointed wings. So look for that long forked tail when they're in flight swooping over your fields. <clears throat> they're kind of an interesting bird because they nest on vertical structures. So they nest on man-made structures, including barns, which is how they got their name, um, as well as bridges and culverts. So we're going to do a poll to see if you guys have ever seen any barn swallow on your property. Um, and maybe if you haven't seen them on your property, you've seen them elsewhere, which is also exciting. So it looks like the majority, um, around 80% have actually seen them right on their property and 13% have seen them elsewhere. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Yeah, my um, parents actually saw their first barn swallows of the year two days ago. Oh, near neat. London. Yeah. Okay, yes, I was going to say I haven't seen one yet. <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay. So next we're going to move on to another grassland bird, the bobolink. They are also threatened and have a pretty big range. Um, they're about the size of a large sparrow. The males are very unique looking. They're black with some white, and then they have a distinctive yellow patch on the back of their head, so look for that. The females are more tricky. They kind of look like a sparrow, but they're a bit more yellowish than a typical sparrow, but, uh, but yeah, they're harder to identify. Um, bobolinks nest on the ground in open fields, such as hay fields and pastures, um, that are at least five hectares in size. And they have the best song. They sound like R2-D2. And uh, I'm just going to play you this one bird song because it is so unique and distinct that um, I wouldn't be surprised if you have heard in the past or that you'll hear it now this summer in your fields. Yeah. Okay, so that's a pretty crazy song. So make sure to listen for that. Um, okay, I think we have a poll for these guys as well to see if you guys have ever seen Bobolink on your property or elsewhere, or maybe you haven't yet, but maybe you will this summer. Okay, great. About 48% of people have seen them on their property, which is awesome. 30% uh, have seen them elsewhere and 22% have not. All right. Well, you 22% listen for that call. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so next we have the Eastern Meadowlark. So these guys are a bit bigger. They are about the same size as a robin. Um, and they're bright yellow underneath, and then they have that black V on their breast, contrasting with that yellow, so that really stands out. They also have a really long bill, um, which is also unique. And they nest in similar habitats as bobolink. Um, so they nest on the ground in large hay fields and pastures. So we're also going to do a poll to see if you guys have seen meadowlarks before. And a good way to find these birds is you can see them singing, um, like they'll stand on a pole or a fence or something and just sing their hearts out. Yeah, so a, a, bit few, a fewer amount have actually seen the meadowlark. 20, mm -hmm. uh, 32% have seen them on the property, which is pretty awesome. 14% uh, have seen them, but not on the property. And then 55% haven't. Okay. Yeah. They are not as easy to spot as the bobolink, so that makes sense. Okay, so next we're moving on to the grasshopper sparrow. So sparrows are quite tricky to identify, um, but what you want to look at for this bird is the yellow patch above the eye, that rusty patch on the cheek, and then there's yellow at the bend of the wing, which is pretty difficult to see, but it's a good identifier. Um, Grasshopper sparrows are very sensitive, so knowing their song is useful. Um, their song 
sounds like grasshoppers. That's how they got their name. They have a very buzzy, insecty uh, uh, call. So that's interesting. And then they nest on the ground as well in dry grasslands, hay fields, pastures, and prairies that are over six hectares in size. And as you can see, their distribution is more limited than the last few birds, but they're still quite widespread. Okay, Henslow Sparrow. So these birds are endangered. And as you can see on their distribution map, uh, they are very uncommon. Um, but how you identify these birds is that they have a greenish yellow head. And so the grasshopper, the yellow was more uh, in a particular spot. This is kind of on the whole head. They also have a really nice rufous colored wings that you can look for. And they nest on or close to the ground in prairies, wet meadows, weedy hay fields, and pastures. And like the grasshopper sparrow, they're quite secretive and knowing their song is helpful. However, their song is very, very short and not descript. Um, but lucky for us biologists, they sing at night, um, unlike other birds. So they don't have a lot of competition. So we actually survey for these birds at night. Um, so it'll be easier to pick out their little short call um, because they won't be competing with the nice call of, you know, the bobolink. Okay. Our last bird, the loggerhead shrike, which is endangered. And you can see on their range map that they mainly breed in two locations, the Cardin Plain and the Napanee Plain. So this bird is gray, black and white with a bold black mask and a large hooked bill. Look out for these guys perched on posts, trees, power lines, uh, searching for their prey in the grasslands and then you'll, you could see them swoop down in the grasslands and grab their prey and these birds are nicknamed the butcher bird and there's a reason for that. They grab their prey and then they impale it on thorns of like a hawthorn tree or some sort of thorny shrub um, or a barbed wire fence if you have one of those. And uh, for a songbird, they're pretty interesting. They eat large insects, rodents, other birds, reptiles. Um, yeah, so they're really neat. And they live in large open grasslands with scattered trees and, and shrubs. So don't get them though confused with uh, a bird that looks very similar, the Northern Shrike. Um, so this bird is not a species at risk. Um, but it looks very, very similar to loggerhead. It has a narrower black mask and a lighter gray head. Um, but luckily they nest further up north, so you're not gonna get them confused during the summer months from May to September. If you see uh, a shrike from May to September, you're likely seeing a loggerhead. Okay, uh, here's our first mammal, the American badger. So these guys are short, sturdy member of the weasel family. They have a long body, short, dark legs um, with a black and white striped face. Um, badgers have long claws for digging. And as you can see in that top left-hand corner photo, um, you can see their tracks with those long claw marks. Um, badgers have a restricted range. They're mostly in Southern Ontario, but there are a few spots in Northern Ontario, past Thunder Bay and kind of near Kenora. Um, and badgers are nocturnal. So for that reason, you rarely see them. You're more likely to see evidence of the badger um, than the badger itself. So when we're out there, we're gonna be looking for tracks, hair, scat, uh, burrows, and burrow entrances are quite large, 20 centimeters or wider. And they're often located at the edge of woodlands, at the edge of agricultural fields, hedgerows, fence lines, um, stuff like that. Now we have the little brown myotis, the little brown bat is endangered, but widespread throughout Ontario and they go as far north as James Bay, which is pretty neat. They forage over water in open areas and they will roost in man-made structures, such as barns, bridges, and bat boxes. But they'll also, also roost in natural locations, like underneath uh, tree bark, or in a tree cavity, or in rock crevices. Um, bats are very difficult to ID, and we're not gonna be catching them, 
Um, so we're actually gonna be identifying that by using handheld acoustic monitors. And these monitors will allow us to see the spectrogram um, of their call. So you can see here on the right hand side, you can see that's a spectrogram of the little brown bat call. Um, next we have the Eastern Fox Snake, our only reptile. Um, so they are often confused with other snakes that have dark blotches along their bodies. You might confuse them with the Northern Water Snake, the Eastern Milk Snake, the Eastern Hognose Snake, or maybe even the Massasauga Rattlesnake. Um, but these snakes are not harmless. They are large. They're Ontario's second largest snake and they can be about four and a half feet long. Um, but they're a very beautiful yellow color, yellow orange color. And then the adults have a very dark orange head that contrasts with their body. Uh, the juveniles, as you can see on the right hand side, they're a little more dull in color, a bit more difficult to identify. And for their range, you can see um, that they kind of have two populations. So the Georgian Bay population is considered to be endangered and the Southern Ontario range, uh, those individuals are in a threatened population. Um, and we have another poll for our snake. So have any of you guys ever been lucky enough to see a fox snake um, on your property or somewhere else? They do have a more limited range, so we might not have as many uh, yeses, but who knows? Okay, looks like most people have voted now and you're right, no one has seen them on their property. Um, two people have seen them elsewhere, everyone else has never seen them, okay. which is to be expected because their range is really limited and they're quite cryptic. Yes, yes, they are very good at hiding, good at what they do. Okay, now we're going to move on to the insects. So first we have the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee which are endangered. Uh, this map here is their historical range. So in recent years, they've actually only been found near Pinery Provincial Park. And how you identify these bees are, is the yellow or pale, or sorry, the white or pale yellow tail. So that's really distinct for bees. Most bees don't have that. Um, they live with, within or near woodland habitat and they forage on flowering plants in grasslands and old fields. Um, and then we have the rusty patch bumblebee, which is actually the same story as uh, the other one. They are both endangered, both restricted to the pinery area and haven't been spotted for a long time. Um, the rusty patch bumblebee got its name because it has a rusty brown patch on its second abdominal, abdominal segment. So that's also quite distinct. And they're habitat generalists. They forage in open habitats and um, forest understories. So we're gonna be taking uh, lots of photos of bees because it's difficult to identify bees in the field. So we'll be taking lots of photos of them um, to maybe even have to identify them later if we can't see all of these markings right there in the field. Lastly, we have the monarch butterfly. So their special concern, they're not as at risk as some of the other uh, species at risk that we've been talking about. Um, their range is, is really vast. There's widespread throughout Ontario and they can be found where wildflowers and nectar are abundant. Their breeding habitat is dependent on milkweed as caterpillars only feed on milkweed. So if you have milkweed on your habitat, then that is potential breeding habitat for the monarch and you are very lucky. Um, so monarchs are orange with black lines and white stripes. And as you can see here in the right corner, we have a picture of a monarch versus a viceroy. So viceroys are butterflies that look very, very similar. But the good thing is that they have this black line um, on their hind wing. So that tells that uh, enables us to be able to tell them apart. Um, yeah, so have you guys ever seen a monarch on your property or elsewhere? So this one will be higher, I'm sure, so that's exciting. <laughs> okay, 
Yeah, so it looks like 87% of you have seen a monarch on your property, 4% have seen monarch elsewhere, and then 9% haven't observed a monarch. Wow, that's a lot on the property. Great. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Now we're going to move on to our actual survey methods for finding these critters. So surveys will be conducted by Blazing Star environmental biologists following appropriate survey protocols during suitable conditions in order to maximize our likelihood of detecting uh, these target species. However, if we don't detect these target species, it doesn't mean um, that they're not present. Confirming that a species is absent from an area requires a lot of survey effort and we're only going to these farms for one day. Um, but as Mo mentioned, we will record if there's suitable habitat. And then of course we're gonna mention or record if the species are present, right? So um, also we do wanna invite all the producers to join us on our surveys to learn how we survey for all these different species. Um, but of course this will be dependent on COVID restrictions and we will be reaching out to the producers um, prior to their actual survey day. So the target window. Um, so this is a graph showing when the species are back um, and when we can survey for them. Um, that a lot of these go for the whole summer, but dark, in the dark green, we have the optimal survey period. And most of that is in June. So for that reason, we are gonna do most of our surveys in June, but they're gonna also uh, start a little earlier at the end of May and go all the way to the mid-June. Um, but this whole period really provides great survey conditions. Um, so this is when we scheduled our, our site visits. Um, so we don't just need to survey during the correct time of year. We also need to survey during the correct time of day, um, right? So the bats will be at night and the hens will sparrow and then everyone else will be during the day, but uh, the, the birds will be in the early morning and then like the snakes could be in the afternoon, right? So we have to tailor our timing for the species. We also need to make sure that the weather is correct for the species. So most of the uh, species that we're targeting require no rain or little rain, um, no or light wind, and over 10 degrees Celsius in temperature. So um, we're going to have to be a little flexible with our surveys because they are very weather dependent. Okay, so we're going to be doing grassland point count surveys for birds. Um, so point count surveys for these grassland birds are going to consist of us standing at a location and recording all birds seen and heard during a set period of time. So our point counts are going to last 10 minutes and we will record all the birds seen and heard during that time with a focus, of course, on our six um, target speech at risk birds. Um, bird surveys will be conducted within five hours after sunset, uh, sunrise, sorry, in the morning, um, when the birds are most vocal. And then we go in the opposite direction for acoustic bat monitoring. So the bat surveys will occur within five hours after dusk um, when the bats are out foraging and they're the most active. So as mentioned, we're gonna be using handheld acoustic bat monitor units um, to detect little brown myotis. And these, um, these units will help us detect the bat calls. So as you can see here, each bat has a unique call. In little brown myotis, their call ends at 35 to 40 kilohertz. And that's an important thing that we're gonna be looking at to distinguish who's calling, because we I'm sure we'll have lots of different species calling in the area. And the other thing that we're gonna be looking at to distinguish their call from other calls is they have an elongated call with a kink in the middle, kind of like a hockey stick. Um, so all these features will let us know who we're listening to. Next, we're gonna be doing visual encounter surveys and we'll be doing these surveys for the fox snake, for the insects and for badgers um, or just even the evidence of the badger's presence. So visual encounter surveys um, mean that we will be walking through suitable habitat slowly and searching for our target species. So when we're looking for Eastern fox snake, we'll be focusing our search effort on rock piles, 
um, existing cover objects. As you can see here, my colleague is lifting up a scrap piece of metal. Um, snakes like to hang it under there. Um, also, we will search around building foundations, low-lying shrubs, and edge habitat. For the bees and the monarchs, we will focus our search effort within fields with wildflowers and photograph the individuals um, so that we can identify them later if we can't identify them in the field. And then lastly, um, for American badger, because they're nocturnal and we're unlikely to see them um, and they're very secretive, we will be looking for badger evidence. So burrows, um, scat, tracks, all that. Okay, and now I'm gonna hand it back over to Mo. Okay, thanks, Sharantia. Uh, so now I'm just going to talk a little bit about a really important component of our monitoring program, which is producer engagement. So um, one way in which we're engaging with the producers is by compiling a species at risk likelihood table for each pr producer's property. Um, so each table will include every species every target species, as well as how likely that species is to be on their property. And this is based on the available habitat, as well as um, species at risk records from databases in that local area, um, and the species range, so the location of the, the farm. So for instance, this producer's um, table, uh, fox snake is not likely, so I'm assuming that's because it's outside of the range of the fox snake, uh, whereas bobolink is confirmed, so I'm assuming that the producer um, submitted a, a bobolink observation with their um, reporting for their BMP. Um, so so this, this table is something we developed for each of the participating producers, as well as a BMP recommendation letter based on the species at risk that are most likely to be present. So the BMPs that we might recommend they implement if, if they're interested in implementing BMPs in the future uh, would be those that would most likely benefit the, BM, the species at risk that are most likely on that property. Um, so after we conduct surveys, we're gonna update these tables. So hopefully we'll have some more crosses in the confirm column um, and maybe we'll shift around some of the other, um, the other likelihoods based on the habitat that we see present. Um, and we'll provide that to the producers, as well as uh, we might, we will likely also um, update the recommendation letters based on conversations that we have with producers. So we're not only providing information to the producers, we're hoping that producers can give us some information. Um, so producers are an excellent source of local knowledge of their property. Um, sure, Sarantia and I are trained biologists, but we're only going to be on their property for a day. Um, and many of these creatures we're looking for are quite cryptic, and you need to go many times um, to see them often. So we're going to try our best, and we're going to go when survey conditions make it um, likely that we'll more likely that we'll see the animals. It's much more likely that the producer who is on the property all the time. Um, has probably seen the animal. So we're hoping we can chat about species that they've seen on the property um, and just chat more about their BMPs and get other information that will help us assess the suitability of the BMP for each species at risk. So um, as long as restrictions, the current restrictions allow, we're really hoping um, that the producers, if they are interested, will come out with us into the field and we can um, they can ask us all their questions about our surveys and what we're seeing and uh, we can learn from each other. Okay, so that all sounds really nice, but a lot of times when I talk to um, landowners about doing species at risk surveys, they get worried and um, they're afraid that they're gonna be told that they can no longer uh, farm or they're just worried that they won't be able to do things on the property. Um, so yes, it is true, species at risk are all protected by the Endangered Species Act. So it is um, actually illegal to negatively impact their habitat or the individuals themselves. 
Um, however, there are exemptions to the Endangered Species Act for agricultural operations. Um, so by us confirming the species at risk uh, in your field or on your property, um, it's not gonna prevent the producers that we're visiting to continue agricultural operations on their land. Uh, so for in terms of reporting, uh, species at risk observations that we collect will be reported to the National Heritage Information Center, uh, more commonly known as NHIC. And this is a provincial database uh, that houses data uh, related to rare species and habitats. Um, so submitted observations, it's really important to submit these observations to the NHIC because the data, this data is used to determine if species ranges and population sizes are changing. Um, so data submitted to NHIC helps researchers discover critical information about defining species. Um, so this data is often used for conservation purposes, uh, which leads to further protection of the species at risk. Um, it's important to note that we uh, will keep producers' personal information confidential in our reporting, um, in both our reporting to the funder and our reporting in our NHIC submission. And you can see on the slide some of the parts of the spreadsheet that is involved in, or the spreadsheet that we use to submit observations. So you can see there's information about the species name, the observation date, the observer's name, and some location information, as well as a few other fields. Okay, so now I'm just gonna talk about the overall anticipated outcomes of our monitoring program. So once the monitoring program is complete, we'll have a bit of a better understanding of the effectiveness of the different BMP types and which BMPs are most beneficial to which species at risk. Um, so these findings will inform recommendations that we um, give to Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association. Um, and these recommendations will be about how to potentially maximize the benefits of cost share programs to species at risk. Um, so we haven't done the monitor monitoring yet, so I can't say what the recommendations are gonna be, but I'm really interested to see what we find. Um, another outcome is we're hoping that um, producer engagement will inspire continued species at risk stewardship. And we're also going to be compiling our results into a report um, that will list the many benefits of these BMPs on species at risk um, that will be provided to the program funder. And um, this should, we're hoping this gives the funder continued confidence that SARPAL and other cost share programs are really um, benefiting species at risk and should continue. And speaking of cost share programs, I just wanted to um, present this slide so everyone uh, is aware that th there are funding opportunities to implement BMPs uh, on your property that will help recover species at risk. Uh, so specific, specifically through Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, uh, programs that are offered include SARPAL, SARFIP, um, and more. And I just included a few bullets there of ways you can learn more about these programs and how to potentially get some funding. So you can contact Maria, her email is there, she'll give you more information. Um, and I also encourage you to subscribe to receive program updates on the Soil and Crop website. Um, that way you'll know, you know when funding um, is available and so you can submit your application right away. And I I think that brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, we do have some time for questions. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, I might just flip back to this slide in case people want to write down any of that information. Uh, also, we are recording this webinar. So if you don't want to write it down, you can just ask us for a recording uh, and we can share that with you. Uh, 
later. So uh, if anyone has any questions, you can include them in the, write them in the Q&A or in the chat. Oh, I see there's a few or comments in the chat. Um, yes. Do you see the one? Do you see the comment in the chat there, Mo? Yes. So will my land location be kept confidential as well? That, um, no. So we, we do plan to submit the actual coordinate. So the actual location of the species are at risk observation. Um, of course, as long as the producer is okay with that, um, it is an important piece of information uh, for submitting for conservation of species at risk. Um, because in order to protect the species, um, we need to know where it is located. So what we generally include with, with the observations is, is a coordinate, so a latitude and longitude. Um, however, we can certainly discuss with uh, producers, and we will let all producers know before we submit anything what we're actually submitting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so someone just asked, is that bat recorder an expensive tool? Um, it, it depends on which kind you're getting. So um, the ones that we have actually are around three or four hundred dollars. Um, and it's actually pretty um, interesting because you can actually just uh, clip it onto your phone and then the results show up on the screen of your phone. Um, I know you can get much more expensive ones. So the kind we have, we actually need to be out there with it. Uh, walking around looking for the bats. You can get much more expensive ones. They're passive recorders that you just leave um, in an area you expect bats to fly by and you can just leave it up there um, overnight and come back the next day and collect the data. Um, I'm not exactly sure the cost of those. I don't know if you know Sarantia. Uh, I was going to say around what you just said. Um, yes, because uh, I was looking at the handheld ones, but I forget how much the the ones that you actually set up and leave. I'm not sure how much those cost, but if you want to look into it, um, Acoustic, uh, Wildlife Acoustics, they're the one who makes these products. Yeah. Um, so you can just look up their websites, like really straightforward. Um, yeah. The Wildlife Acoustics website. Yeah. Thanks, James. Just shared the oh. link in the chat. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, Okay, about $750 for those ones. Okay, yeah, those ones are more expensive because, uh, yeah, you don't have to be out there um, mm -hmm. walking around in the night. <laughs> yeah, okay, and I just wanna address Pam Jackson's comment here. Um, so she says it's important to note that if this monitoring wasn't happening um, and a person is trying to do some kind of development on their land, so they wanna, let's say build a house or something, um, that person would pr likely be required to have an environmental impact study conducted anyways before doing such a development project. And part of that study is actually having a biologist come and conduct species at risk surveys. Um, so um, yeah, so whether there are records submitted from us or the, the records submitted by the person conducting the environmental impact study, um, it doesn't really change anything. Um, you're still required to, to get the development permits. Um, yeah, and often, and I should say, mention that um, if there's species at risk habitat, um, near your project development, um, it, it does not mean that you can't ever change the land. It just means that you might have to do some kind of a mitigation to prevent um, negative impact to that species. Um, so for example, if you're proposing a project and you have to cut down some trees um, and it might be species at risk bird um, habitat, then 
you need to make sure that the trees are being removed not during the breeding season and that the trees are replaced. Um, so there are mitigations you'll probably need to do, but um, having species at risk habitat confirmed doesn't mean you can't do anything with your property. Um, there's another question here from BJ. How long uh, do we expect the surveys to last? You can answer that one, Sarah, too. Um, so we're planning on doing them half day. We're planning on going to a farm for either the morning or the afternoon. So if we're going to be doing birds, we'll have to get there uh, before sun sunrise <clears throat> and survey all morning. Um, and if we're doing evening bat surveys, uh, then we'll be there in the afternoon until a few hours after dusk. Uh, so uh, how many hours? Maybe six hours would be from start to finish at your property? Yeah, I think it depends on the size of the property as well, the size of the area we're it does, and some producers at. have multiple um, properties, so we also have to still figure out um, how many of these like fields we'll be going to and where we're going to be targeting. Um, so yeah, it, it is quite dependent, and uh, yeah, if they have a lot of different BNPs and different fields that we need to be driving to, um, it may be longer, and maybe some would be a full day, but we are planning for half days. Uh, so Eleanor asked when we will let you know when we're coming. Um, so we have provided a date range to all the producers so far, uh, so just a, a week. Um, within the next week, we're hoping to send specific dates. Yeah, yeah, we're making a, a specific uh, survey schedule soon, and we will give you a specific date um, with some buffer due to weather. Um, but it will be in that original week that we already emailed about. Um, we really hope that you guys are able to attend too. Um, you wanna steal our knowledge and we also wanna steal your knowledge. So, so the feeling is mutual. We definitely want that, um, but yeah. We will have to see. Oh, you have missed that email. Okay, I will email you tomorrow, Eleanor. <laughs> hmm, okay. Okay, so I think what we'll end up doing is probably just sharing the webinar recording with everyone who's participated tonight, who we have the emails for, so everyone will just get it. Um, That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. We can definitely do that. And but anyways, I would... Oh. Yeah, questions. Um, do you know the difference between a coyote den and a badger den, Garantia? Um, I have never surveyed for that, so, um, I am not sure. Definitely brush up on that before we head out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, well, it is now eight o'clock, so I think we're going to wrap things up. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I know it was a short, kind of a short notice when we put, pulled this together pretty quickly, so we're really happy everyone could make it. Um, for those of you who are, who will be visiting, we really look forward to meet you, meeting you, um, and we hope you all learned something from this webinar. Mm -hmm. All right, people are sending some nice links in there for grassland birds and talking about the NHRC. This is awesome. I will drop in 
the link for the NHIC if people are curious for checking their area and seeing what things have been reported there. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting to see. I don't know if my message went through. Oh, it looks like someone else. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. All right. Oh, good. Glad you guys learned a lot. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, people are starting to drop off. Mm -hmm. Should we should we wrap it up then? Sure. I guess I will end the meeting then. All right. Well, thanks everybody for attending. It means a lot to us. Yep. Yeah, bye. Okay. Bye.